The Earth's upper crust is similar to a human bone. Both are strong, but both are brittle. If I were to fall and the force of that impact exceeds the strength of my bone, my bone will snap and fracture. And this is exactly what happens in the Earth's upper crust when forces from opposing tectonic plates exceed the strength of a rock. Except we call that snap an earthquake and the fracture a fault. But unlike in humans, the Earth has no doctor to put these fractures or faults back in place. And this leaves major deformities that form weak points in the Earth's crust. And these weak points will snap again and again. Over time, this generates large faults, the most significant of which form at the Earth's tectonic plate boundaries. Part of the Australian Pacific plate boundary runs through South Island, New Zealand. And so it came as a surprise that the 2016 magnitude 7.8 Kaikoura earthquake did not occur on the large fault that forms the major weakness in the region. Instead, the earthquake bypassed this major weak link, rupturing 21 different fault segments. And there were gaps of up to 15 kilometers between some of these earthquake ruptures, which is something we've never seen in any earthquake before this. The Kaikoura earthquake is therefore the most structurally complex earthquake on record. And we've yet to figure out why this earthquake was so complex. Now this earthquake was devastating. It, sadly, it killed two people and it had a massive economic impact. The images on this slide show some of the destruction that the earthquake caused. And what's worrying is that an earthquake like this is likely to happen again, because Northeast South Island is at significant risk of large magnitude earthquakes. So it's really crucial we can understand why it was so complex. What we do know about this earthquake is that it must be linked to the tectonic development of the Marlborough Fault System. Now the Marlborough Fault System is a series of four faults shown here in this black box that have formed a transition zone between two major plate boundaries. To the north, we have the Pacific plates subducting and diving beneath North Island. And to the south, we have the Australian and Pacific plates sliding past and colliding with one another which have built the huge mountain ranges of the Southern Alps, the South Island. Now you may notice that the epicenter for the Kaikoura earthquake is slightly south of the Marlborough Fault System. And it's been hypothesized that the major faults in the Marlborough Fault System developed sequentially from north to south. And that the Kaikoura earthquake is evident that the new major fault is now in development. This means that investigating and understanding the development of the Marlborough Fault System is crucial for determining how tectonic forces are transferred in this transition zone between two major plate boundaries. This will allow us to answer the question, why was the Kaikoura earthquake so complex, which hopefully will contribute to earthquake hazard mapping and risk mitigation in South Island, New Zealand. Currently, there are large gaps in knowledge surrounding the structural geology of the Marlborough Fault System, and geologists have made a hypothesis of development based on interpretation of existing data. And this hypothesis is shown in this animation here. And this involves the Marlborough Fault System rotating 120 degrees over the last 20 million years, followed by the reactivation of pre-existing weaknesses as old faults in the Earth's crust. Now, this large amount of rotation is extremely unlikely. How can this whole block just rotate in space? It doesn't make sense geologically. And if there are these old faults in the Earth's crust that are acting as pre-existing weaknesses, how can I be standing here in this earthquake rupture that didn't occur on one of these pre-existing weaknesses? With this in mind, I set out to design my own investigation into the development of the Marlborough Fault System. Now, unfortunately, I can't do this in real time because I don't have the next 8 million years to spare. So instead, my solution is to try and recreate the tectonic conditions of South Island in a 20 by 40 centimeter box filled with sand. And I'm able to run this scaled down model over a one hour time period, which is a little more effective for me to finish my PhD on time. Now, if we take a look at this rotated map of South Island, we can see that the dominant plate motion is the Australian plate sliding past the Pacific plate. And this is the exact plate motion that our sandbox is able to recreate. And it works like this. So we have a fixed half and a movable half that is pushed by a motor. And as this movable half slides past the fixed half, it creates a discontinuity at the base of the box, effectively creating a fault. We then fill this box with sand because sand deforms in the exact same way as the Earth's upper crust, which makes it a great proxy. We sprinkle coffee grains on top of the model. This allows us to use sophisticated software to track the movement of these coffee grains while the model is running which allows us to create a map showing the deformation in the sandbox. And this deformation map looks like this. So here, once again, we can see the model running, but we've got this deformation map on top. 
with blue showing the highest amounts of deformation and red the lowest. And you can see that as this model is running, the deformation quickly becomes localized on this single fault over the discontinuity at the base of the box. And if we compare this back to the Marlborough fault system, you can see it doesn't look very similar. This model actually looks more similar to the single fault to the south of the Marlborough fault system. However, if we look at this sandbox as the displacement starts before this single fault develops, we can see that the zone of deformation is much wider. And in this wider zone of deformation, we have these faults here in blue that are developing oriented around 15 degrees relative to the direction of plate motion, which is quite a similar orientation to the faults of the Marlborough fault system. So this got me thinking more about how the crust must be deforming in this plate boundary transition zone. And if we take another look at South Island, we can see that to the south of the Marlborough fault system, all of that deformation is localized on this single plate boundary. So it deforms in a similar manner to this block diagram here. However, in the Marlborough fault system, we're now in this transition zone between two major plate boundaries. So the deformation of the Earth's crust is distributed across a 100 kilometer wide area. So the deformation must be occurring something like this in this shown in this block diagram here. Now, in order to try and recreate these conditions in the sandbox, my solution was to tape a piece of stretchable material to the base of it. And this is taped slightly over that basement discontinuity. And of course, I chose this material to be pink. So now as I run the model, the sand in the box should be deforming over a localized deformation here and by distributed deformation over the stretchy material up here. So this model looks like this with the deformation map shown on top. So you can see here that area of localized deformation and now this area of distributed deformation where that stretchy material is. And we can see that in this model, once again, where there's localized deformation, a single fault quickly develops over that discontinuity at the base of the box. Whereas faults in the area of distributed deformation take much longer to develop. But when they do develop, these faults are equally spaced, they're oriented around 15 degrees to the direction of relative plate motion, and they develop sequentially from north to south. And I'm really excited about this result because as you can see from the Marlborough fault system here, both the model and the present day Marlborough fault system look very similar. So what does this mean about how the Marlborough fault system developed? Well, you can see from this figure here just how similar that deformation map is to the faults of the present day Marlborough fault system. And I was able to generate the faults in this model without the need for any rotation and without the presence of pre-existing weaknesses. So this likely means that the Marlborough fault system developed in a much simpler manner than previously hypothesized. So as I've shown here in this animation, as these two major plate boundaries propagated towards each other over the last 20 million years, Northeast South Island did not rotate but remained in place until these plate boundaries were close enough to generate distributed deformation between them. This distributed deformation then caused the Marlborough fault system to develop sequentially from north to south. And this model of distributed deformation can be applied to other plate boundary transition zones across the globe. And what does this mean about the complexity of the Kaikoura earthquake? Well, with this southward development of the Marlborough fault system, it shows that the Kaikoura earthquake is evidence that a new fault is in development. And with no major pre-existing weaknesses in this area, there's no major fault to break. So perhaps this is why the Kaikoura earthquake was so structurally complex. And this means that while this new major fault is in development, we can expect more structurally complex earthquakes in this area in the future. Thank you so much for listening. And while I'm having my 15 minutes of fame, I thought I'd finish with an image of these cows, which had their 15 minutes of fame when they got stranded during landslides caused by the Kaikoura earthquake and had to be rescued. Thanks again. And are there any questions?